Hey y'all. All right, I'm here today with a exciting, science simplified, well exciting for me. Uh, this had a lot of background work for me and it's this topic that is just so interesting. So I actually have two research papers for this as well as some excerpts from the book Hungry Brain. And if you guys saw my post about this, I've been talking about this book for a while and it is absolutely amazing. I would recommend it to every single person who is interested in anything, you know, health, fitness, diet related. Uh, and this is just a really, really awesome book. So there was a ton of interesting concepts in there. And this one really just stood out at me. Um, and it has to do with variety in the diet or rather lack thereof <laughs> uh, variety in the diet. So I, I wanted to be very thorough with this because it's an interesting topic and I don't believe that it should be applied 100% like as you read it. I think that there are nuances to it that we can all learn from, like most things in science, right? Uh, so that's why I have the two papers and then the book. So there's going to be two parts to this video just because uh, it's going to be very long otherwise. And the first part is going to be just the science. It's going to be the two articles and the parts from the book. And then the next one will be the application portion of it. So you guys know that for these videos I like to do those together usually, but I just felt like there was too much under the same umbrella that I wanted to talk about um, as far as like research and I didn't want to make multiple videos like different like video here, video here, and I wanted them to be together. Um, but I do want to split it up just because I know it's going to be very long. So the second part will be the application, what I think that you guys can take from it, what you can, uh, you know, use for your clients or friends or family members, whoever. Um, I think it's just a really interesting concept and stuff that they brought up in the book. So this is just a little bit of taste of what you can find in here. There is so much information, you guys. I really can't recommend this enough to everyone. So shout out to Stefan. You are the man for writing this book. So this is part one, you guys, which will just be the science portion of it. All right, so for the first paper, this is called Variety in a Meal Enhances Food Intake in Man. All three things that I'll be talking about are related to humans. Uh, there is animal research on this as well, but I wanted to stick to human research if I could. So basically what their idea going into this is, is that when you have a particular food that you've eaten, and say it's like a savory food, uh, and you've eaten enough of it to satiety, you are, you know, you're satisfied and everything's been good and then, you know, you don't want to eat any more of it. But then suddenly you are presented with something that's like sweet, completely different. Your body like grows a second stomach, <laughs> we've all been there, uh, and then you want to continue to eat even though you just said that you were full. So this is actually known as sensory specific satiety. So very, very interesting. So basically what they've demonstrated is that you will have a pleasantness for certain food until you reach satiety and then that liking for the food will decrease. However, liking for foods not eating remains relatively unchanged. So again, think of that savory and then sweet kind of thing. Um, and I know I've experienced that a million and one times. Uh, definitely have a dessert stomach. Uh, and I know you guys can relate to that too. So very, very interesting what they um, are looking into. Now, they had three different studies, like mini studies within this. They were very easy um, studies to complete. So that's why I'm imagining that they would do that. So um, at the first one, what they did was they had little sandwiches. <laughs> I can't imagine being a subject in this. This would just be so funny. Like as I'm reading this, I was like, this is just so interesting. So the way that this was set up was that it was four eight minute courses. And so the variety group was given four different sandwiches at the eight minute increments. And then the playing group was given the same sandwich four different times. And it showed that um, having the different, the variety, they ate more. Um, individual preferences had little effect on the results. The subjects ate significantly more sandwiches in either course two, three, or four in the variety condition compared to the same, the plain, same filling group. So really, really interesting. And again, this is, this is like a, you know, you're not going to go somewhere and have like four different courses of sandwiches, but think of this in like a buffet or think of this just as like an appetizer meal. Um, and dessert set up. So this is very, very interesting that they ate more and had a greater response to the variety within the meal. Now, these were four different sandwiches and they were all different. So um, later in the paper, the, one of the third things actually shows something very interesting. So know that these are four distinct flavors of sandwiches versus one and they ate more in that. So the next one was even more specific as far as uh, they all had yogurt. They had three, it was either three yogurts or one yogurt flavor, and they were all very distinct in color, texture, and taste. So specifically, it was hazelnut, 
black currant and orange so you can't get more different than that <laughs> um and so like again the the different variety so the sandwiches were very different um but then this and they but some of them may have had different caloric values which is why the they did this second part so all the yogurts had the same caloric value, but they just looked a little bit different, tasted different. Um, they came out in big bowls. This is why I'm like laughing. I'm like, could you like imagine like showing up and there's just like bowls of yogurt you have to eat? <laughs> like, just like so crazy to me. Um, so they did three 10 minute courses on this. So again, either three different types or just one type each time it came out. Um, and so I think the distinct part is very, very important to pick up, remember that. So as with the other uh, part of this experiment, part two showed the same thing. The variety group ate more than the plain group. And plain not meaning plain yogurt, plain meaning just one type of yogurt. Um, so really, really interesting. And so the, the authors said, you know, both males and females increased their intake, um, like the amount that they ate, the amount of calories that they ate, of course, because the more you eat, the more calories you eat, and the number of subjects going, showing, the number of subjects showing a greater response to variety at the first course. So again, we saw that when variety is offered and things are distinctly different, people will eat more than if they are given the same thing repeatedly. The last part of this, what they did was they wanted to look at what if we gave people the same types of yogurt. So they were very similar color, uh, similar taste, and they actually picked out little fruit pieces so you couldn't even tell. So they this time they used um, cherry, strawberry and where's the other one i just saw it oh cherry raspberry and strawberry and they like i said they picked out the fruit pieces <laughs> um and they were it was very hard to detect which like which one was which so it was these three variety versus just one type of yogurt um same idea uh, it was three 10 minute courses so almost identical to the last one but this time it wasn't very distinct and what they showed was that their offering the variety showed no increase um, in intake. It didn't show any increase over the, or the, over the course of the experiment when they like any varieties, like no, no specific increase with any variety of yogurt. And also the rate of intake declined similarly between both groups. So basically, um, the flavors differed a little bit, but the texture or the appearance didn't. So there was no difference in the amount of food that was eaten. Just the discussion in general, they kind of started off with these two sentences, which I think are very powerful. If several foods are offered in succession, which differ in taste, appearance, and texture, more will be consumed in a meal than if only one food is given, even if that single food is the favorite. It also appears that the more dissimilar the foods are, the more likely that the effect will be. So that really summarizes kind of all three of these studies. And it's really interesting because when you think about how things are set up as far as like a buffet or just typical dining habits, this is can really, you know, be something that's powerful to people. And I'm not saying this is powerful for people. We'll get into this in the application part for who can understand how to control their intake. But think about the majority of people in like the world aren't really aware of how much they're eating. So this could be something very, very simple that they could, you know, change. They call it the buffet effect, I think, in a lot of, of research which is why they closed out actually with this part. So variety in a diet is important for the ingestion of a balance of nutrients. However, because satiety is at least partly specific to a food which has been consumed, having a variety of foods available can lead to increased food intake during a meal. And then they say, you know, we don't really know how much this has impacted obesity, but given that there is such a wide variety of food available in Western, Western societies, it is possible that this could have an effect, again, on satiety. So the next one is influence of a monotonous food on body weight regulation in humans. Again, this is a human study, really excited. They open it up, they do have some good sites as far as animal research, and they have shown that um, normal rats, really, really interesting, when palatable food is available, intake increases and body weight stabilizes at that higher intake. When less palatable food is available, intake diminishes and weight stabilizes at this lower value. So I think that types of those types of research got these people excited about this thinking about this um and it's it's really really just interesting how they set this up so this is not something that anybody could honestly like really do <laughs> um but again it's just showing uh the impact on this they were fed this like liquid drink <laughs> it was 500 calories per um per can it didn't say like the macros on it but i'm gonna assume that it was probably just like a balanced shake which is mostly probably carbs a little bit of protein and some fats um and they were 
subjects were given this at ample supply. They could have as much as they wanted. Um, they were given it at their homes and they said consume this ad libitum, which means however much they want, um, at their normal meals, you know, three times a day. Try to food, try to avoid thinking about other food, um, things of that nature, and just kind of do whatever you want with this, you know, with these shakes. So on the first few days, these people averaged four cans, about 2,000 calories. Um, but by the second or third day, the quantity diminished to two or three cans, between 1,000 to 1,500 calories. Um, the results of this behavior was a decrease in 3.13 kilograms, which is a little bit less than seven pounds. So really interesting that without even trying, obviously these people decrease their intake much like the rats did because this is not very palatable and you don't want to just drink liquid stuff all the time. In the discussion, they talk about this paper, which actually is in my book notes as well, um, where they had obese people do this and they were on this for four weeks, like a shake, and most of them ate less than 500 calories uh, for four weeks. These were like obese people who were eating thousands of calories and they just suddenly dropped off their intake and reported not being hungry. So this stuff is like crazy to me, right? And so basically what they're saying is that some control of body weight may be around satiety um, and just it may be involved in the regulation of body weight and also how challenging it is to maintain that body weight. They took people um, and they dieted them for the same amount of time and had them try to lose as much weight. And basically what happened was those people who were voluntarily reducing their intake, um, like AKA dieting, were always complaining about the diet and always complaining about you know fighting off hunger and dreaming of food. You're not gonna be able to eat a liquid diet for <laughs> like your life, but this type of research is so interesting to me. Um, and it, it's just like a crazy, I've never even heard of stuff like this before I read the book. Uh, these are my notes from the book. It's actually chapter uh, six, The Satiety Factor. And so to talk a little bit more in depth about that obesity study, uh, volunteers were instructed to drink as much as they wanted of this liquid, and they just spontaneously dropped their intake around 500 calories because they just weren't hungry. They lost weight rapidly, um, but starvation response never kicked in. Uh, low, reward, low reward of food may have lowered ad adiposity set point. So these people who are willingly dieting and thinking about dieting and dropping their calories have a harder time. Um, and it's just so, so crazy to me um, that when these people for three weeks, they just, they, they drank these shakes and they lost weight and they're like, yeah, we're in good spirits, you know, no worries. Um, and then the other group that was trying to lose weight, uh, continually fighting off hunger, dreaming of food at night. Uh, we've definitely all been there if you've ever dieted. Um, and it, so it goes back to this idea that the diet palatability um, influences the set point. So the author, what he talked about was less rewarding food means our body don't fight it. Doesn't mean, means that our body doesn't fight us as much. I've never really heard too much about this, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, and he talks like in part of the book and he's like, the secret really is, which you'll never find, uh, and diet books and stuff is to eat simple. Lower reward food um, is not as motivating, right? Nobody's like, oh my god, I like so can't wait to eat these like boiled potatoes. Actually, I do like boiled potatoes, but you know what I mean? Um, versus like a candy bar or something like that. So these are obviously extremes. He wasn't recommending to anyone to do this, but keeping very processed food possibly or highly rewarding calorie dense food to a modest level may help um, actually ward off, you know, the dieting problems that you may see. So I don't know, I am fascinated by this and there is research to back this up. Um, and I wanted to kind of share this with you guys because I, it's something new to me. It's something that I haven't even really heard about anyone talk about. So that's why I wanted to show two studies and then notes from the book where he of course cites everything. So this is part one. Part two, I'm going to talk in depth about um, the you know, just what I think really the application can be for this. Uh, again, definitely not suggesting that you should go on a bland liquid diet, but I do think that some of this can be um, useful to people moving forward. So definitely uh, watch the next one once it comes out. Thank you guys so much for watching this one, and I hope you enjoy the next one as well.